Okay, cool. So yeah, so your friend's like, hey, so you like, hey, I just watched the new season of Stranger Things, um, which is awesome. So you tell this to your friend, and your friend goes home and he watches both seasons of Stranger Things. So this is your friend at home. And then he sees you the next day and he's like, oh my god, that was great. I want to watch more shows like it. Can you suggest any? Now the problem is, you're a hardworking Berkeley student, so you don't got time to watch more than one TV show. So what do you do, right? How do you find more shows that are like Stranger Things? Uh, so imagine this, right? Imagine you have a black box that can featureize any TV show. So um, what that means is that this black box, given the input of a TV show, it'll, it'll spit back a vector of like numbers, right? Where each element corresponds to like a weight of a certain feature. So it returns this featureized vector. So imagine you have this black box, right? What can you do to find the most TV, the TV show that is most alike uh, Stranger Things. So, well, we can just obtain the feature vector for every TV show on Netflix, and then see which vector is closest to the vector corresponding to Stranger Things, right? So, that's basically the idea and the motivation behind k and um, And the basic, like, main idea, right? k and is basically, you see, given at test time a new data point, you see the k nearest data points to that point, and then based on their properties, you classify the data point. So training time is literally nothing, right? You have a bunch of test data, you, store, you just store that labeled data that you have. You don't do any pre-processing, nothing. You just store that data. But at test time, you're given an unlabeled data point. All you do is you look at the labels of the k nearest data points to that point. So if it's like a categorical variable, then you can just do like a majority vote in the class. So, like, if three out of your five neighbors say red, and two of the other five say blue, then you'd go red. Um, if the labels are continuous values, for example, like height or weight, you could just take an average. Um, maybe you want to weight that average by the distance each point is uh, from your training point. Um, that's also a valid thing to do that uh, usually results in increased performance. Um, but yeah, that's like a, that's pretty much what KNN is. Like, it's very simple. All you do is look at the k nearest neighbors to your point. Um, so here's like an example of a k and classifier. So here, the, we just have two labels, uh, blue and orange. And so this is basically a 15 and then classifier, which is for each data point, it'll look at the 15 closest to it and then predict its label. So we can see this corresponds to like the decision boundary. So anything on this side will be blue, anything on this side will be orange. And this boundary is made by seeing the 15 closest points each of the data points. Um, so what is k in this instance? k is like a hyper hyperparameter. You choose that k when you want to build the model. Um, that's not something that the model optimizes for you. Um, and so here's like a nice visualization of that. So it's this pretty good blog post I'll post on Piazza after. Um, so it really uh, explains the effect of k on your on your decision boundary. So imagine we have a bunch of data points that just look like this, right? Um, if we do k equals one, this is the decision boundary that results. You can see we have a bunch of like blue splotches here, like red splotches here in the middle, right? All in blue territory. This is not what, what we want to happen. Um, this only happens because like we have some like outlier points over here, right? Um, and since we only look at that one nearest neighbor, if our point was here, like in the middle of blue territory, but since the nearest neighbor is red, it, happened, it classifies as red. So this results in like a lot of variance in our data or in, in our model because we have a lot, a lot of these jagged edges. Um, but we can increase k, for example, um, and the decision boundary becomes a lot smoother. You don't have any of those like red um, or blue splotches anymore, and it generally in, uh, improves performance. So uh, yeah, to recap, like if, if you have k equals one, um, then you're only classifying the point based on the nearest point, the one nearest point. So that means like moving just a little bit can cause you to flip your classes. So that means there's like high variance because your test points, just a little bit of variance in that can cause you to flip like your prediction. Um, so that's really high variance. Um, this this also means that there's low bias because if you tr if your if your um, decision boundary is really jagged then all your training points will be classified correctly. So that's like really low bias. But on the flip side, 
if we have k equal to n, where n is the number of training points, um, I mean, think about it intuitively, right? That means like for each prediction, you're looking at your whole data set and you're doing the same thing. That means whatever prediction you have, you're doing the same exact matching. Like you're looking at exactly the, the same exact points. That means there's like no variance in your method because every prediction is exactly the same, pretty much. So this leads to like high, uh, low variance, but high bias. Um, yeah, you can imagine like if you're doing the same thing for each data point, like you're gonna have a high bias. So, um, so this is kind of like a better visualization. So this is KNN with just K equals one. And as you can see, like a really high, like jaggedy edges. Um, it's just like, like the definition of overfitting. Um, but this is really what we want, right? Like we want to see like smoother curves and smoother edges. And we have this little point jutting out that represents like the orange and that's kind of like more ideal. So how do we determine this correct K, right? If K is too big, we have high variance. K is too low. If k is too big, sorry, we have high bias. If k is too low, then we have high variance. Um, we just use cross validation to figure it out. So we separate some of our data into our um, into our test set, and then we test like you know the average error on our training versus test, um, and we figure out what the best k is. This is actually taken from our Wednesday night homework. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? Is Canon like pretty easy like to understand? Um, like the the main takeaway from KNN is the main thing to grasp your head around is that low K means uh, low bias and high variance. So that's a uh, pretty confusing for some people. So yeah, just keep that in mind. But yeah, otherwise it's pretty easy, pretty naive algorithm. So um, okay, so that was like the last of our supervised methods. So now we're gonna just talk about unsupervised learning. So. We, Let's explore this distinction a bit, right? So, so far, yeah, you've only touched on supervised learning. Um, so in supervised learning, you're basically given data that is labeled. And, you know, for every input, you have the target output. So you know what, how to construct your model, right? Your model has to predict that output given an input. Uh, but in unsupervised learning, you're just given a bunch of data that's not labeled. So you just have, like, a bunch of inputs. And the question is, like, with all this data, and no specific targeting goal, can you still do stuff? Like, can you still find meaning in the data that you have? Um, so, yeah, the answer is yes, right? So we want to explore the data and see if we can uncover any patterns or structure that might be useful to us. So for example, like, here on the right, we have supervised learning with the classes, so we can just construct a decision boundary. But here, we just have a bunch of data points, so like, one thing we can do is find clusters in them, since we see that these data points are these data points cluster together. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> Pretty basic. All right. So K means clustering. So um, just thinking out loud, like motivation, and intuition, right? On the previous slide here, we saw that you know these data points are probably like similar elements because they're clustered together. So that's like the intuition we want to have here, right? If we can find similar elements, they're probably going to be like in similar via distance in our data set. So let's, let's find these clusters of similar elements. So k means is an algorithm that finds these clusters, um, specifically k clusters in our data set. Um, so k means just means the k here refers to how many clusters you want to find. Um, so each cluster can basically be thought of as a bunch of similar points centered around a mean. So what k means is really finding are k means, like, like the k averages or k mean points in your data set, and then each point will be closest to a mean, and that's part of its cluster. So our algorithm, our like, goal is to basically how do we find these means. Um, so just like a brief visualization before we dive in, this is like some original unclustered data that you might have, and after running k means with k equals 3, you might get something that looks like this. And that kind of looks alright, you know, because you have like a, like a, you can see this cluster down here, and then maybe you sort of be spread out data points into two. Um, so the k-means algorithm is basically this, right? You first randomly choose k points initially. Then for every point in your training set, you find which of the k points it's closest to. So first you have like random k points, then you look at all the training points you have, and find which of those k points your training point is closest to. 
So now you have all your training points labeled like one through k, right? Which 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 uh, which cluster is closest to? Um, so we have these k different groups or clusters now. So now based on these clusters, we can find the mean of each cluster. We just average all the data points in, our, in that cluster to find the mean. And these these means are the new k points. So now we have k points again. We can repeat. So k means is a very iterative algorithm. You first find the means, then you find the clusters that those means represent, and then from those clusters you calculate the means again. So this can be kind of hard to follow, so let's do a little visualization. And yeah, just like a side note, like closest is like a metric we can pick. So distance is a, is a metric, for example. Yeah? Uh, does k means always converge to the same k points? Uh, no, that's actually a very good point. Um, and we'll see that in the visualization. So k-means will converge, um, but it won't necessarily converge to the optimal or to the same point every time for the same k. Um, it's very biased on or dependent on where you start these k points initially. So if you start it in a bad place, it might get stuck in a local optimum and not be able to reach the global optimal. What are other common metrics? Um, so we could use distance. We could use um, some sort of like weighted distance function. We could... Yeah, different different types of norms. So instead of like L two norm, like L one norm, L infinity norm. Yeah. Um, so here's like a demo. Yeah. So here we have we start these k means off initially randomly. This is like, and now we find the clusters representing those means. So we just, and then we move those. We recalculate the mean based on these clusters. And now we again recalculate the mean, and we assign the points randomly, and then we recalculate it. Does that kind of make sense? Is, was anyone stuck on that? Like how, the, how that works? Do you guys kind of see how it's like iterative? Like you first find the means, then you find the clusters, then the means, and the clusters again? Yeah. So there's like a better demo of it. Uh, yeah. So this is like more high speed, but yeah, that's essentially what it does. So we know for a fact, like k means is guaranteed to, to converge, um, and we'll talk about why a, lot, a little later on, and we'll have some more intuition about that. Um, but the point is that depending on where you start off your k means, you could converge to a local optimal instead of a um, global one. So um, it's usually a good idea to like, just like. Um, run k-means a few times with different starting points and see what they converge to. Um, and the one that it converges to most will most probably be the global optimal. Uh, yeah, they're just doing it a bunch of times, so we don't have to watch something. Okay, cool. So um, now we're gonna go through like a code demo of this. So there's like a there's a Jupyter notebook in the day eleven clustering folder. If you guys take a look at that. And you have any anyone have any questions by the way? Yep. Yeah, so there are like a few heuristics. Um, one thing you could do is you could partition your data set into like k partitions and then find the means of those and use that use that as a starting point. Um, there's also like a lot of other ways to do it. Like, like I, I don't really know too much about like all the different ways you could do it, but I'm sure you could read up on it. Yeah. And that'll be something interesting to do. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, everyone like open up the Jupyter notebook on the GitHub. So I think it's called like k means demo or something. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're just gonna walk through this like step by step, um, and I've coded out the whole algorithm. So hopefully you'll be able to see like better how this works. So first year we're just like importing some standard libraries. Um, oh yeah. And so for the first try, let's just uncomment this. So simple k-means. So here what we're doing is we're going to generate our data. Um, all np.random.normal does is just generate like uh, points from a normal distribution. And this is like the mean and the covariance. You don't have to worry about that. Um, yeah. Why does your iPad come up with it so weird? I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> um, it's called like Jupyter Notebook Styles or something like that. If you guys want to check it out. <laughs> no, I, I just hated the white, so I, I 
So um, here, here, size equals 42. This basically means I'm going to generate uh, 40, 40 data points that are each two-dimensional. So um, I'm going to have like an x and a y for each data point, um, and I'm going to have 40 of those. That's all you need to get out of this. So let's go ahead and generate that data. Um, can everyone see this, by the way? Is there anyone having trouble? OK, cool. Um, so first thing, you know, let's visualize our data. So let's just scatter plot it. And it looks something like this, you know. All right. So this is like two-dimensional, you know, as I said before. So we can plot x and y. Um, and now we're going to do a k-means on it. Um, so I'm going to just, just say k equals 4. And, you know, these are the colors I'm going to plot it with. OK. So here, in this first code segment, first I'm going to like randomly, um, the first thing I'm going to do is randomly assign each point to a cluster. So I'm basically going through for every point in my data set. Um, I'll choose a random number between 0 and k. This random number represents the cluster. And so th that's that cluster i. And then I'm just going to add that point to that particular cluster list. That's all I'm doing. And then I'm just going to make it a numpy array at the end, which is, yeah, whatever. Um, so now that I've done that, let's go ahead and visualize the data again. So it looks like this, right? And I, well, you can see I basically just like randomly assigned a color to every, every um, data point. Is everyone good so far? <coughs> cool. Um, so this, this line of code here basically just calculates the mean for um, the means for each of these clusters. So I'm basically saying k data here is like a list of lists, right? Each list in k data is uh, the list containing the points for that cluster. So I'm basically saying for every like cluster list, find the mean of that cluster list, and that's going to be by k mean. So if we if we like look at k means, we'll see that it's like a, it's four, right? Because I have four means or four clusters. And the mean is two-dimensional because their data points are two-dimensional. So that kind of makes sense. That's all k-means is doing. Um, and then I can plot it again, right? So the means here are represented by these, like, diamond things. Hopefully, can you guys see that, like, the diamond versus the, the dot? OK, cool. Uh, I was kind of worried about that. I spent, like, 20 minutes trying to look at different, like, pointer things. But anyway, irrelevant. So, um, so this is like the first iteration, right? We randomly assigned colors to our data points, and then we calculated the mean from that. And those are our means. Now, what we're going to do is based on these means, we're going to assign each data point a cluster. So that's what we're doing here. Get, get the k data, the k clusters. So I'm going to basically say, right, for each of the means that I've calculated, I'm going to find the norm of the difference between the point and the mean. So I'm basically, I'm finding like the difference between the norm, the point and the mean, and I'm just calculating the norm, right? The L2, uh, yeah, L2 norm here. Um, and I'm just choosing the smallest one. Um, the point is going to be assigned to the cluster uh, from who, which mean it's like closest to, right? That means this difference is smallest. So I just do that, and I append it, and then I just make it a numpy array. Does anyone have any questions on this method? Cool. Um, yeah, and then the get k means method will just return the means. It's the same line we saw before, and then we just have like a basic plot dot scatter thing. So here now is the second iteration, right? From our um, from our means, we will now like label all these data points, and you can see like the blue will capture all this area because it's like the lowest into the right. Same with like the green on the other side, and the the yellow and the red kind of split it. And here, now we're going to, based on these new data points, we'll recalculate the mean. So you can see, like, since the blue is being pulled down to the bottom right, the blue mean has shifted down to the bottom right. Um, and we're going to do this, like, a bunch of times. And then basically, we just do it 500 times to make sure it converges. Um, and then we can plot the end result. So yeah, that's what we get. Maybe we have to do it more. Yeah, so basically now our K clusters are like there's some red in the middle, yellow, green, blue. So you might be like, okay, this is still pretty shitty. Like I didn't really I don't really see any clusters in here, right? Um so the problem with this is if you go back to the where we originally like 
created our data, it was from one distribution. Like this distribution was like fixed, right? And we ju just generated it from one distribution. That's why our clusters look pretty bad. Um, so let's go ahead and comment that out and comment out these next lines. So what I'm doing here is I'm generating data now from four different distributions, right? One distribution is centered at 0, 3, another one at 3, 0, another one at negative 3, 0, and one at 0, negative 3. So basically like the axes, right? Like plus 3, minus 3, plus, minus 3, plus 3 here, right? Um, and from these centers, I'm generating data. So intuitively, now we have four different sources of data, all like pretty far apart. So this should make our k-means better. So let's just go ahead and see. So we can kind of see here, like, just in the visual visualization, that the data looks pretty separate. So we can go through. And oh, wait, hold on. I think I missed something up. Yeah, so, oh, one more. Yeah, so this kind of makes more sense, right? Like, this more represents what was happening in our data set. Like, we found the blue over here, the red, the green, and the yellow, and they all kind of represent where our data came from, because we generated these, uh, the data based on these axes. So in fact, we could actually take a look at our means um, and see if they were close to our original prediction. So they kind of were, right? This is like pretty much 0 and 3. This is 2.7 and 0, negative 3 and like pretty much 0, and then almost 0, and then negative 3, right? So they kind of estimate our, our original means from our original like drawn distribution pretty well. OK, so that was like pretty boring. Um, let's go into something more fun. So like. It's pretty boring just cluster like random points that we generated, um, but k-means can actually be used for a lot of things. Um, one example of this is image clustering. Oh, yeah, question? Uh, I was just wondering, like, how do you think grids start using this? Oh, yeah, that was a question yeah, uh, Drew asked earlier, I think. Um, basically, I don't really know. Um, my intuition is that if you just start in a bunch of places and then see where most of them converge, um, that's a good uh, point. Maybe you could use some heuristic where you partition your data sets um, and find the means based on those. Um, but I'm not really sure. You should look into that. That'll be a quick thing to do. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so clustering can actually be used. K-means clustering can be used in a lot of uh, contexts. And one pretty cool application is image clustering. So in there, what we do is instead of looking at distances, we look at how different the RGB values for pix pixels are, and we cluster pixels who have the, approximately the same color together. So I've cut it up an example to do that. So let's kind of do that, right? So let's load in this like flowers image that I've loaded. Oh, anyone have any questions by the way so far? Any other questions? Okay, cool. So we have this flowers image, right? Um, so does anyone know how like an image is represented um, on a computer? Like how it's stored? Anyone want to volunteer an answer? Yep. Each pixel is stored as a number. Uh, correct. Almost, yeah. Each pixel. So he said each pixel pixel is stored as a number. It's it's uh, actually stored as three different numbers. R G B. Yeah. Um. So each each um each number ranges between zero and two fifty five. That's how that's how much of like red G and B to use. So for example, image data, we can look at its shape. Um, and you'll see that. That's exactly what we find, right? It's a 600 by 960 image. Um, so that's 600 by 960 pixels. And each pixel has three values, RGB. That's the third dimension. So you can imagine this um, picture as like a 3D volume. Um, and so if we look at the data, it kind of just looks like this, right? A bunch of like RGB values. So let's do clustering on this. So let's first like take a look at our picture. So our picture looks like this. It's like a pretty good picture of like some beautiful flowers, right? Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do k-means clustering with k equals 10. So we'll just set k equals to 10. Um, and now we're going to uh, like do the same process that we did before, um, but it's just in the higher dimensions. Um, so here I'm saying 
I'm going to have this have this 2D array called pixel clusters, and it's going to be the same dimension as my image. Um, but instead of that last three shape, it's just going to be like you know 600 by 2, 960. And basically, I'm saying um, for each cell, I'm going to assign a random cluster between zero and k. Um, so this will like this will give me like a 600 by 2 by 960 2D array where each point is between 0 and k, representing which cluster that particular pixel belongs to. Um, so that's the same thing we did ab above and before, where we like randomly assigned um, each point to a cluster. Now here, cluster centers basically um, is for, for each of the, for each of the um, pixel, like for each of the means, I'm going to go ahead and like find the mean of, of those values in the, in the 2D array, and then those are going to be my cluster centers. So I'm saying for each like cluster, right, I'm going to first filter out my image with like, you know, the, where the pixel cluster equals that cluster, and then I'm going to do the mean on that, and I'm going to store it in cluster centers. So this will basically find the average color of the cluster. Does that kind of make sense? Um, right. Um, and then, so that's the first step, right? That, this is finding the cluster mean. The second step is now, based on the mean, assign each pixel a cluster. So that's what this method here is doing. I'm basically saying um, for, for each of the clusters, for i in range k, I'm going to first find the data points from that, from that cluster. Um, and then I'm going to find the mean of that. Yeah, and then I'm going to find the mean of that and, and assign it, right? And then here, I'm basically saying, oh, right here. Um, I'm basically saying, yeah, for, like, I'm going to loop through each of the dimensions of, their, of our image, and I'm going to subtract that pixel value from the cl cluster center for each of the clusters. And I'm going to choose the smallest one, like the smallest distance, which is exactly what we did before. So now this will, so the above step recomputed the cluster means, this one will recompute the cluster. It will provide a, clu provide a cluster classification for each of the pixels. So, yeah. So this takes like a pretty long time to run. Um, just because like I couldn't figure out how to vectorize a, like a Python, um, a Python method to like make it faster. So like if we look at one iteration, we're going to see that our image looks pretty, like, brown. Um, and the reason for this, I, like, I didn't initially know this at first, is that, like, once you reason the clusters, sometimes if you start it off initially bad, then, like, doing an empty list slice means that you end up with, like, NAND values. Anyway, I had to, like, figure that out. So if we just run it for five iterations, then it should be much better. Um, and we can kind of see what the end result will be after that. So this code here is just basically recomputing the cluster means and then um, the actual clusters for the pixel cluster. Does anyone have any questions on how we did that? Okay, cool. Um, so basically the takeaway from this is that um, we can approximate images with few colors pretty well, right? Um, and you'll see when this uh, image finishes loading in a sec. Um, but we have this like image of like each pixel being 255 by 255 by 255 colors, right? So that means like there are like two, like 16 million possibilities for the colors, right? And now what I'm doing is I'm limiting those possibilities to 10. I'm literally just going to find 10 color means. And I'm going to color those, that image with those 10 color means. So from 16 million to 10, we're going to see what the output image will look like. And it looks like this. Right? That looks pretty good. For 10, this is literally just using 10 colors. And we can kind of see, like, you know, some of the blues, like the shading has still remained from, like, the original image from up here, you know. And it's analyzed, like, the blue in the back. And, like, that looks pretty good. And I only ran this for five iterations too. Like if we ran this for more, like probably look better too. So that's that's the whole theory behind uh, image quantization. 
which is basically breaking up, uh, quant uh, quantizing your color values um, into like discrete boundaries so that you can represent your image with a lot less information. So here, we approximated it like relatively well with just 10 colors. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, anyone have any questions on that? Yep. Uh, in this Um, like you mean the edges over here? Oh yeah, for example, especially when you're like transitioning like from red to blue or like red to yellow. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't actually have a reason for that. I'm not sure. So like the main difference between here and what we did before was that before we used like the image to measure similarity, right? Or the, the distance to measure similarity. So how far a point was from this cluster that kind of determined uh, which cluster we'd be in. Here, we're not using distance, but we're using how far the pixel color value is from the cluster mean. So we're not really using like the spatial location of any of these pixels. Um, but that's like, an interesting point that you brought up, and I haven't talked about that, so I can say, yep. Yeah, so it's just a, some Python error. Um, what was happening was that like when I randomly generated the numbers, um, what happened was in a randomly generated, like since I'm generating so many, the means of all the clusters tend to be very equal to each, like very similar to each other. And then what happened was that some of the clusters would have like no data points in them. And then when I tried to do a mean on an empty slice, it gave me like a NAND value, so that just like blanked everything out. So yeah, I, I was debugging that for like an hour. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I think this is pretty cool. You guys can like try out like your own faces or whatever, like put put in whatever image you want, just like change uh, change this flowers that JPEG to whatever image you want, and then kind of like see the results. It's pretty cool. Oh, also this is like really slow, so if you want to do it by yourself sometime, just use like a library. Like I just did it for demonstration purposes. But yeah. Okay, cool. So that was k-means. Um, so yeah. Some applications, image quantization, um, which is what we already saw. Um, we can also use this to find similar documents or images, audio, et cetera. Um, really, what we need is just some notion of similarity, some metric of distance um, to compare these two together. So for documents, one, one of them is like the Jacquard coefficient. If you've heard of it, um, it basically compares the similarity of the frequencies of different terms in documents. Um, and we can use it for a lot of other things. So um, just some, some formal definitions. So for k-means, right, we want to find k subsets of our data. So if s is all our data, we want to find k subsets of them su such that the union of all of them um, make k. And we want to minimize the distance from each point to its cluster center. So that means that here we want to find the min of first we're iterating over all our clusters, then we're iterating over each data point in that cluster, and we're summing the distance from that point to the cluster center, to the mean um, of that cluster, basically. Mu i is the mean of that particular cluster. And here we're using the L2 norm, but you could use any other norm that you want. Um, now, unfortunately, there's no like closed form solution to this, so you can't just like solve it immediately, um, which is why we need to use the iterative algorithm. Um, and that's what k-means is, it's an iterative algorithm. Um, and it's guaranteed to converge, although it could, could converge to a local uh, maximum. And we'll see um, why it's guaranteed to converge later on. So one question you might be having is like, why does it even work? Like we're just like arbitrarily like finding clusters, then centers, then clusters again. Like, why is this so useful? Um, and to like have some intuition about that, we need some like basics and probability. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So here's the setup, right? I go to a park. I find a bunch of dogs. Oh, does anyone have any questions before I start this, by the way? OK. So I go to a park, right? I find a bunch of dogs, and I record their heights. And then I find a bunch of cats, and I record their heights. So I have some data that looks like this. I have one dimensional data. It's just the height. I'm plotting it on this line. Here I see the red points here are the cats, the blue points here are the dogs. 
Can you guys in the back see like the red versus blue? Yeah? Okay, cool. So here, yeah, these are the dogs, these are the, these are the cats. This is what my data looks like. So one thing we can do is estimate the distribution from each data. So you guys must have heard of the normal distribution. So this is really useful in real life because like a lot of things converge to the normal distribution. So from these data points, we can estimate the distribution for the heights of cats and for the dogs. So all we need is like the mean and the variance, uh, which we can easily compute. Um, okay, yeah, so let me walk through this, right? So we can compute the mean by just like averaging all the points and the variance by like taking like how far away they are, distance squared or something like that from the mean. Um, and then we have the distribution one for the dog and one for the cat, right? This is what that looks like. Um, so the formula for the normal distribution is that, right? It's something something e to the something squared, and it's x minus u squared. So x is the point, and mu is the mean. So it's basically saying e to the, dis uh, the difference in distance squared. Um, and this basically, it's an uh, if you integrate this from negative infinity to infinity, it sums to 1. So what that basically means is that anywhere along this distribution, if I just place a point and I'm like, here, like I'm passing this in, right? I'm going to say probably I'm going to pass in x to that formula. It'll tell me the probability of the height being that height. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm saying, so basically think of it this way, right? There's like I go to the park. There's an infinite sea of dogs and cats. I randomly sample some dogs and I randomly sample some cats. This is the distribution that I get. Now on the next time I go and I sample a dog. What's the probability that his height will be a particular height? That's that probability. It's p of x, which is just x plugged into this formula, right? So you can see here that this probability is maximized when the mean is really when the point is really close to the mean. So when I'm like right here, I have a really high probability um, of pulling out that mean or pulling out that height. When I'm over here for the cat, I have a really high probability. Does anyone have any questions on this? This is just like normal distributions, and then that's like the PDF of a normal distribution. But that's not important. All, all you really need to worry about is like, um, the, like this curve represents the probability of drawing that height from that distribution. Cool. So now we do that, right? We have these two distributions. So now, you know, a friend go, goes and gives us a new data point. He says, Oh, I observed this animal with like height seven. And he asked us if that's a dog or a cat. So what are we gonna do, right? Well, it's pretty simple. We already have the distributions. So we just check the probability under each distri distribution and see which one is more likely. So we see, you know, the probability of height being seven given the, the mean and the standard deviation of the cat versus the mean and standard deviation of dog. So for example, if I'm all the way here, right? then the probability that I'm under the dog curve is much higher than the probability I'm under the cat curve, because the cat curve like goes to zero all the way here. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions on that? Okay, cool. So, you know, life is great when you know these distributions. Um, but this is an, a lecture on unsupervised learning. So what do we do if we don't know which ones are cats and which ones are dogs, right? Seems like we're kind of stuck. Because what we used in the, previous, in the previous slide was we used these distributions. But now we can't find these distributions anymore because we don't know which ones are cats and which ones, which ones are dogs. So if we want to classify a new point, we don't know what to do. So this is like our fundamental, fundamental dilemma, right? If we knew the distributions, we can classify all our data points by just checking which distribution it's more likely under. Does everyone... Does that, make, does that make sense to everyone? That's pretty much what I said in the last slide. We can check which distribution it's more likely under. On the other hand, if we knew the labeling of the data points, we could then calculate the distributions and we'd be set. Does that make sense too? So it's kind of like this dual thing, right? We don't know the labels of the data points and we don't know the distributions. If we knew either of those two things, we'd be fine. But we don't know any of them. We don't know either. Right, so we have neither. Um, so that's a fundamental problem, and we want to get around that. 
So just some terminology. So the labels, cat versus dog in this case, um, they're called like latent or hidden variables. Why are they hidden? Because there's still variables that affect your data set, but we can't observe them. We don't know what they, if they exist or like what those labels are. So we call them like hidden variables or, or latent variables. Anyone have any questions? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so here's like a recap of a fundamental dilemma, right? We observe this, a bunch of unlabeled points. If we had the distributions, we could classify them. I have colored the points here, right? We can classify them. If we had the colored points, we could find the distributions. But we have neither of those. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. So, what do we do, you know? Like, can we just assume we have one of them? Sure. And we'll talk about that a bit. Um, but let's kind of review what we know first. Just some like mathematical background. Um, so this is like a normal distribution in, in one dimensions, right? So we call this like a Gaussian distribution. Um, same thing as normal. Um, so that was in just one dimension, right? Now think about you have data points in multiple dimensions. So you still have, you can still model a Gaussian in multiple dimensions. It's just now called the multivariate Gaussian. And instead of having a mean, like a singular scalar value, you have a mean vector. And if, instead of having a variance, like a single scalar variance term, you have a covariance matrix. So don't be scared of that. Just think of like the same normal distribution you have, but in multiple dimensions. That's all it is. Um, and we have some intuition that, you know, maybe these Gaussians can help explain the latent variables. For example here, right? We have these two Gaussians to explain the cat versus dog variable. So maybe we can use these Gaussians to model the latent variables in our data set. Uh, yeah, so that's our goal, right? We want to estimate the distributions. We want to estimate the mean vector and the covariance matrix for all, for all of the, um, the classes. Cool, so that leads us to the EM algorithm. By the way, um, it's called Gaussian mixture models because at the end, basically, we, ba we have like a mixture of multiple Gaussians, Gaussians, which basically means we have like many Gaussians representing our data set. But yeah, that's just like terminology. Okay, so input is a bunch of unlabeled data. We suspect that there are clusters in the data, and these clusters are explainable by latent variables. So we want to model Gaussians in order to explain those latent variables or find them. So we want to estimate these latent factors by approximating the Gaussian distributions. Um, and we want k of those Gaussian distributions. k, again, is a hyperparameter. So you can kind of think of this as k-means, um, but instead of just finding the means, you're finding the means and the covariances. So let's do a demo first to just give you a picture of what that looks like. So this is the, first just look at the data, right? This is the old geyser data set. You can kind of see intuitively there are like two clusters. Um, why are there two? Well, um, old faithful, oh, sorry, old faithful, right? Old faithful has like two eruption modes. Um, and they do it does different things based on these two eruption modes. So this data kind of like normally clusters itself around these two um, based on its eruption mode. So we think, okay, you know, there might be this latent variable, the eruption mode in your data set. Um, so let's just go ahead and go ahead and cluster, use the EM algorithm with two centers, uh, with two clusters, um, see what this looks like. So we, again, it's the same thing as K means. We randomly start it off, which is pretty bad in the beginning, um, but eventually it converges to something. And the key point here is to, to look at, like, now it's like a mean and a covariance, right? So it's not necessarily a round sphere or a round ball as in K means, because we have different means and covariances for your data. Does this kind of make sense? Just like the intuition, right? I'll talk about it a lot more. Okay, cool. So um, another really important thing to remember is that um, in K means, you basically said, is this point closer to which of the clusters and then assigned it to a cluster? Here, you're not assigning it to a cluster. 
you're computing the probability of it being in a cluster. So this is like a soft assignment. For every data point, you're going to say, what's the probability of being in cluster 1? Probability of being in cluster 2? Probability of being in cluster 3? Etc. Does this kind of make sense? So it's like a, a varying scale now. You're not assigning it, but you're computing the probability. And then when you go and compute the means and covariances, you're going to use these soft assignments or these, weight, uh, these probabilities as weights to compute the means and the covariances. Um, so don't worry about all this math. I just took this image from somewhere. It was this part that's really good, right? So here we have our data. We're going to randomly start it off with these two, two distributions. You can see that all of this is pretty much blue on the right, but these ones in the middle are like half blue, half yellow, mostly yellow, half blue. And then over time, as our algorithm converges, you know, and starts to find the centers, we can see that here in the middle, like, most of these points are like, here in the middle, are half blue, half yellow. So this is like a soft assignment. For each data point, you're saying, what's the probability of being in one of those, right? And then down here, eventually when it converges, you can see one cluster here, one cluster here. But still, the points in the middle have like probabilities weighted um, attached to them. So that's it, basically. The key point is remembering that we have probabilities for each cluster for each training point. And that allows us to be more expressive because now we can model the distribution as like a mean and a covariance, which means our data can take multiple, like many different shapes, not just like one ball. Yeah, question. What are you, how are you moving the distribution? Don't you just start out with the first? How are you moving those two dimensions? Oh, right, yeah. So, um, um, the math is kind of complex in multiple dimensions, and I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more, but just think of it as k means, right? So, first you're starting off with like randomly assigned uh, means and covariances, right? Um, as in k means, just start off with random points. And now, you're gonna, here, when we're labeling it, we're gonna compute the probability for each cluster. That's the same thing as computing which cluster I mean, it belongs to in k means. And now, based on like these new probabilities, you're gonna compute the means and covariances for your data again. And then you're going to assign probabilities again. And then do it again, and again, and again. Yep. Any questions on that? Yep. Are the clusters pre-labeled in terms of or just choosing a like deciding the cluster also? No, no, no. So this is not, this is not uh, labeling our data. This is just the different clusters in our data. So yeah, there's no label on this at all. We're just showing the blue and the yellow because we, have, we said k equals 2, so we're just differentiating between k1 and k2. Does that make sense? Any more questions? Okay, cool. So here's the problem setup, right? We're given x, a bunch of training points, x1 to xn. Um, so our model is x comma z distributed, like picked from p theta. So theta is the underlying model we presume to be true. We don't know the underlying model. That underlying model gives us x and z. You can think of this as like your training points and your latent variables. That's what it is. Z, we don't know. It's a latent variable or a hidden variable. The model is distributed with respect to both x and z, but we only observe z. So cat and dog, for uh, instance, for example. The x here is the height, and the z is the cat type. Right? Which pet type is it? Cat or a dog? So the, the underlying model, or like the model here could be like the distribution of pets in the park, for instance, right? So when we draw samples out of it, we the model, the true model draws both the x and the z. It draws both the height and the pet type. But we only observe this x. So that's why both the model and the z are unknown. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so our goal is to estimate the model such that the probability of that model, given our data, is maximized. Basically, we want to find the model that best explains our data, right? But now you may notice, right, this is just in terms of x. What happened to z? z is still a factor in our model. If you, if you know, like, using um, conditional probability or marginal uh, probability, you know that p of theta given x is the sum of overall z, p of theta given x and z, right? 
Does it make sense? This translates to this. These two, these two quantities are equal. Right? We're writing, this is what we want to, this, this is our true model, but we only know how to maximize this. So we're going to write this in terms of this. Does that make sense? Um, the problem here is that this is still really hard to maximize. Why? Because this is really non-convex, so we can get stuck in a lot of, lot of local uh, optimas. Also, we don't know z, so it's really hard to sum over z. Any questions on this? Okay, cool. Um, so the EM algorithm basically says, instead of trying to maximize it all at once, let's use the iter iterative, iterative, iterative approach of k-means. So first we initialize theta naught to some random theta naught, right? Some random model. Same thing we, we did. Some random means and covariances. That's basically what it means. Same thing in k-means. Um, then we're going to repeat until we converge the E step, right? So EM algorithm basically means expectation maximization. So there's an E step and an M step. So the E step is basically given our model at time t, we're going to find like the model at time t plus one, right? In order to do that, we get, we need to find the expectation of the probability of drawing x and z given our model, right? Given x and our model at time um, t, uh, t, oh wait, this should be t plus one. Um, is that gonna make sense? Okay, so let me, let me talk this through again. So we're gonna take the expectation given x and our model at time t. So we know these two things. Does that make sense, right? We know our data, and we know our model at time t. We know, we know what these two things are, right? Then, from that, we're going to compute the probability of x and z with respect to t plus 1. That's what q of t plus 1 is. And then the m step is basically, we're just going to maximize um, theta t plus 1. We're just going to maximize q, which will give us the best model. So we're basically saying, using the data, compute all the probabilities, right? That, that's basically what it's saying. Using the data that we have in our model, compute all the probabilities. Then, in the other step, we're just going to maximize them. Same thing in k-means. Using our data and the, cluster, and the means we have, compute all the clusters. Compute all the cluster assignments. Same thing here, compute all the probabilities. And then, once you've computed all the cluster assignments or the probabilities, you're going to find the new cluster means or the new model parameters that will maximize those probabilities. And does everyone see the relationship? Okay, cool. If you don't like totally understand all that math, that's okay. Um, just get a sense of like where the terms are and how they make sense. Um, so um, let's let's take this step by step, right? So this is our kind of like true model. This is what. This is what we want to find the maximum of, right? This is what, what we want to approximate. Um, so we're over here. We're at this part. So in the E step, we're going to find the probability distribution, right? We're going to find the probability of all our data points. So what we're going to do is we're going to approximate this function with this function over here. That, that, that's what that E step will do. It will approximate our, our true function with some sort of function based on the current model parameters. And that's what this looks like. And then, we're going to maximize this function that we found, right? So what does that do? That means we move our point from here to here, which is the, which is the middle of the maximum of this function. That means that on the true model parameter, now we've reached here. Does that make sense? So then on our next iteration, we'll do the same thing again. We'll construct another approximator at that point, and then move again to the maximum. And we'll keep iterating until convergence. This also means, or this is like also a demonstration that every time we compute the E step, when we maximize, we won't do worse than what we already did, right? Because we're just approxim we're approximating that function with this function, and then we're finding the maximum with this. So this is like a lower bound on what our probabilities could be. This is never going to be a higher bound. It's always going to be a lower bound. So this means that at, iter at each iteration, at each time step, our approximation will only get better, right? This still means we could converge to a local minimum, right? We could have like some absolute maximum over here, 
we could still converge to local maximum, but we know that each time step we're only going to get better or stay the same, our worst case. So this, is, this can also be viewed as like an alternate form of gradient descent. We're using like probabilities instead of um, taking derivatives. We still have to take some derivatives, but yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the E step is like calculates the lower bounding function, and the M step maximizes. Um, so pros, you know, like your model at time t plus one is always going to be better than the model at time t, meaning the probability of your data at time t plus one is always going to be better than the probability of the data at time t. So this means you're guaranteed to converge, right? You are guaranteed to converge. Um, and it works pretty well in practice. That's the pros. And then cons are it could converge to local max. Um, yeah, so like a pretty crucial observation, right? So E and M is different from Gaussian mixture models. So Gaussians are just how we approximate our data. The E and M algorithm, like nothing in this algorithm says that we have to use Gaussians to approximate our data, right? This is very like model independent. So this data could be anything. In practice, we use Gaussians because they work well in practice and they show up a lot in like natural data. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good tool to use. Um, and e &M, like usually goes with Gaussian mixture models. Um, so yeah, the key takeaway is that like, ENM can be implemented many different ways, right? Like for example, k-means is just a special case of the EM algorithm. Like k-means doesn't use Gaussians, but it's still an EM algorithm. It still does the expectation maximization stuff. That's why like a lot of the analogies are really similar. And like this is why the k-means will always converge. Because we, like, we kind of showed that the EM algorithm will always converge because the E step always provides a lower bound that we maximize. And the M step. Anyone have any questions on this? This is like a cool connection to see. Yep. Yeah, um, I like miswrote that. This, sh this should have been a T plus one in, in here. Uh, in here. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's kind of cool to see that like, k-means is just like, we have this super complicated algorithm. Everyone uses k-means. K-means is just a special case of the ENM algorithm. Um, yeah. So k-means versus GMM, right? Um, GMM, now we're talking about specifically the Gaussians. So the Gaussians account for uncertainty in our clustering assignments. So that basically means we can have probabilities for each cluster, or we can have un measures of how certain or how uncertain we are about each cluster. Um, like for this reason, k-means is more sensitive to outliers. Um, because if you have a data point like all the way out here, k-means will try to find like the average of all of, all of that. So k -means, the center of k-means will pull it out all the way out. Does that make sense? But for a Gaussian mixture model, it can just assign the probability of that data point really low. And so it doesn't influence the mean as much. Does that make sense? This is pretty cool. Um, and the other crucial observation is that k-means assumes that all points are clustered in identical spheres, right? Just like these round balls with the with same distance away, right? But this is not ideal because true data doesn't look like just a round spherical ball, right? It has like unique distributions and different scaling along each axis and different like um, like variances and the way they like vary with each other. So Gaussians, the Gaussian mixture model, can adapt to these unique uh, distributions and it provides like a more robust and um, expressive model. Anyone have questions on this? Okay, cool. So, so yeah, we'll just talk about like distance functions for a bit. So that's like the heavy math. Um, there's gonna be like a little more math, but later on. So this is like pretty easy material now. So distance functions, we're just gonna talk about like 
what makes a good distance function when using a clustering algorithm. Um, so you can have many different distance functions for k-means or k-n-n. Um, common choice is L2 norm, but as we mentioned, there are other ones you can use as well. Um, but there are three properties that it must satisfy, right? One is the distance between x and y must be positive. There's no like negative distance. Um, and this distance only equals zero if x is equals y. So the, this can only be zero if you're trying to find the distance between the same point. Um, and that's if it don't only. Um, also it's like symmetric, so distance between x and y equals distance between y and x. And the last one is the triangle inequality. So distance between x and y has to be less than like the triangle formed by x, y, and z. So it has to be less than distance between x and z and z and y. So you can like think of this as like the two legs of a triangle and a hypotenuse. Like the hypotenuse has to be less than that, than the sum of the two legs. So this might seem pretty obvious, but it's important to keep these in mind when you're talking about distances in like higher dimensions. Okay, cool. That was all for distance. So we'll do hierarchical clustering now, um, which is like not that important, but like it's like clustering, so I have to talk about it. So, um, yeah. Any questions so far, like on on GMMs, Gaussian mixture models? What do you do with habits? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll take like a quick two minute break, and we'll do attendance. Do you know the URL is? Oh. What? Anyone have any questions, by the way? Just like ask questions if you have any. So it's a tinyurl.com slash DSD unsupervised. Thank you. 
Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to continue. Uh, we have some really cool stuff later on after this. So, yeah, well, this is my like, favorite section coming up. Right? So, um, not this. This is, okay. So, higher, uh, hierarchical uh, clustering. So, there are basically two types of hierarchical clustering. Um, hierarchical clustering basically means you put your data into hierarchies. So, you have like a tree where something's at the top and more things are at the bottom. Um, so agglomerative is basically a bottom-up approach. So in your data set, you find the two most similar instances, and then you merge them. And you call that one instance, and then you repeat. Find the next two most similar, and you merge. Next two most similar, then you merge. So you first initialize each data point to its own cluster, and then you really pick the two points with the smallest distance, whatever distance metric you're using the two points with the smallest distance and you merge them. And then you keep repeating until you only have one cluster. So you end up with like a dendrogram that looks like this, right? So all these are data points. So first you see, oh, A and B are the closest, so I'll merge them together, right? And so that will cause these two, these two to merge over here. And then I'll merge like J and K, these are the next closest. So I'll merge them here, right? And then at each point, you know, I'll keep merging and merging, and if, like eventually here you'll merge like the, the merging of A, B, and C, D. So merging two like merged clusters together. So I'm building like hierarchies and hierarchies. Everyone kind of see that here? Yeah. So like the first thing I merge is like has the most depth in the tree. Because it's like the first thing I merge. So it's like all the way at the bottom. Um, so like there's one one thing we have to think about, one slight thing, right? Like once we've merged A and B, we're not considering that this merged instance with all the other ones, right? So how do we find the distance from like G to the merging of A and B? Right? There's like a slight thing we gotta consider there. So one way is to define define it as a closest pair. So here we have these two merged instances, one and two, five and six. How do we find which one is closest to one uh, to this cluster, right? We can see which one, like, where is the closest clustering available? Like, the closest point from inside the cluster, where, where it leads to, right? So here, two is closest to five, so I noticed that. Another way to do it is farthest length. So here, like, one and four are, like, furthest away from each other, so I merge those. So just like within within like your, your merged bubble, how do you assign distances? Another thing you could do is like average. But these tend to work the best. And the point of this is just basically building this dendrogram. So you can see like the hierarchy of the data. Um, okay, yeah, so divisive clustering. This one is like the opposite. It's a top-down approach. So you start with everything in one cluster, and then you find two dissimilar components and you split them. So you split the two clusters, maximizing the, the distance between those two clusters. And then you, you recurse on each sub half. Um, yeah, and this tends to be like more efficient because you can stop your, like a lot of times like it's not useful to look at like all the little leaves of your, of your dendrogram. So you can stop, with, stop this one short like before it reaches the leaves. So like, it can be more efficient that way. Anyone have any questions on uh, hierarchical clustering? 
devices versus agglomerative? Yeah, it's like it's like cool, I guess, to do some visualizations, but it's not like really useful. Okay, spectral clustering. Um, this is like really cool. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll just like show you guys. So um, this is like a very new way of thinking about clustering. It's not something we've done before, like thought about in this lecture so far. Um, it's really efficient, like really, really efficient, and it produces like amazing results. Um, and you see, it, you'll see that at the end. <clears throat> um, and it's really cool. Okay, so the key point here is. Let's think of each data point as like a vertex and a graph, right? So we have, we have a bunch of data. Let's just call each data point a node, a vertex. And we have this, this graph constructed with all these data points as nodes, right? Um, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect similar points with an edge. So suppose all these red dots are data, right? If two points are close to each other or similar, we're gonna put an edge between them. So like these further away points don't have an edge between them because they're not pretty similar. But these points, all these points here are like similar together, so we, we draw edges between them. Um, and we want the property that larger weights mean more similar, right? Um, because if there's no edge, that means they're really dissimilar. And like these weights probably would be really high because they're like really close together, so really similar. So not only like do we do decide like not to connect some, we also weight each edge by how similar they are. And the more similar the elements, you weight them more. Yep. Oh, yeah. Any questions on that? So where is defined by closeness, right? Um, any metric you want. So yeah, any, any sort of norm, any metric. You could feature your data first and then do some similarity comparison. Um, yeah, really any way, like any function. As long as it satisfies those three properties that we talked about. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so now we know, we know, okay, the graph has two things, right? The vertices and the edges. We know what the vertices are, those are fixed, those are data points. But how exactly do we, do we go about constructing those edges? Um, so we want to weight them in such a way that we give a higher score for similar vertices, right? Um, a common formula is to use the gas, Gaussian distance. Um, I think that they should be negative there, but this basically means xi and xj are my two data points. I'm going to find the difference between them, and then I'm going to square it raised to the power of e. This basically means that when, um, just imagine like a negative e in front of it. Okay, just like negative. Yeah. So um, this basically means that when these two points are the same, that means this is 0. That means I'm raising it to e to the 0, which is 1. Everyone follow? Right? When they're the same point, when they're super similar, I get a weighting of 1. When they're really far apart, right, this is like some almost infinity term, then I get e to the negative infinity, again imagine that negative here, e to the negative infinity, that goes to like 0. Right? So I have like an exponential decay from 0, from x equals 0 to x equals infinity, and it just keeps going down like this. So the further away these two points are, the less weighting there is between them. Does that make sense? Any questions? And this uh, variance is a hyperparameter you set. And it's actually pretty important for the results you get. Your graph is basically like the bare bones of this algorithm. Like you need a, a good graph will like make, make it work really well. So yeah. So now, now we find out like how to weight the edges. Now how do we connect, how do you know which edges to connect, right? We, one, which, one of them is like connect every edge. That will lead to like a really dense graph where you have like v squared edges. Another thing we can do is connect to the k nearest neighbors, right? Yeah. We can connect to the k nearest neighbors. Um, or we could, you know, connect to points within epsilon, some threshold, some threshold distance. So this can help promote the sparsity, you know. If you set epsilon to like 0.1 perhaps, then we'll only have distance weightings with with edges more than 0.1. So there, these are like different ways, different trade-offs, again. Um, I wouldn't recommend the first one, because it, it'll lead to a really dense graph, but 
Um, the second two are like different alternatives you can use. And it just varies. Like use cross-validation to figure out you know, what's best for your application. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have some graph that looks like this, right? This is our graph. We have like some number of edges, we have like these vertices. Um, what do we want to do with it, right? We want to cluster. So we want to split it into two halves, or split it into some number of halves, right? So we can assign it to clusters. So we want to split this graph. So this is also known as the min cut, right? Given all these endpoints, we want to find the min cut in this graph. Does that make sense? We like we, we want to find the min cut because larger edges mean more similar. So if we break a larger edge, that means we're breaking similar elements, which is what we don't want. We want to break small, like small edges. So we want to find the min cut. So let's formalize this a little bit, right? We want to minimize finding the two sets such that the union of the sets is the set of all vertices. And we want to minimize the distance from every vertex in one to vertex in another, if the, if the distance exists, right? So we can just imagine if like, there's no edge for distance is zero. Or the weight is zero. Distance and weight are the same thing. Does that make sense? We just want to minimize the sum, right? So if you like split here, we want to minimize the sum of the, of the edges crossing, crossing the two halves. OK, cool. So we have this formulation. Let's go ahead and apply it. This is what we get. Right? Does everyone see why that happened? We were literally just like finding min cuts. So like, OK, well, OK, I'm going to cut one edge. Here you go. Okay, this doesn't really help us. We want to find like two clusters. You don't want to find like this thing and then one data point, right? So what we want to do is we don't want to just find the min cut. We need balanced clusters. So let's normalize the cut by how many elements are in each, each cluster after the cut, right? So now our formulation looks like this. This is the same thing as before from last time, from the last slide. This is the sum of the, we're still finding the two, the two sets of vertices um, that split our vertex set. We're summing over all the edges from one, from one set to another, right? But this time, we're adding in all the, uh, all the edge lengths from one vertex and all the edge lengths from the other vertex. Uh, from the other set, sorry. From one set and another set. So we're normalizing it by this factor of how many, um, how many edges are in each set, each set. So this is called like normalized min cut. Any questions so far? Is there a new formulation? OK. So turns out normalized N min cut is NP hard. So if you don't know what NP hard means, that means uh, there is no way to solve it efficiently, basically. Um, there's no, yeah, there's no, yeah. No polynomial time algorithm, basically. And even if you had a solution, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's the correct solution in polynomial time. So this is pretty bad. We can't use this min cut, normalized min cut. So, you know, happily, we have something else. We can approximate this with a special matrix based on the graph. This matrix is called the Laplacian. This Laplacian will help us approximate the normalized min cut. Um, and I'll introduce what that is. Um, and a cool key observation, the Laplacian also turns out to be a low rank approximation of the Gaussian kernel. So like in the STM lecture, remember when you did like RBF kernel to Gaussians? Um, this turns out to be like a low, pretty crude approximation of that, but it's pretty cool. Like there's some like deep connections that I don't understand, but you can feel free to look up. Okay, so let's find the Laplacian, right? So the formula for Laplacian is D minus W. What the heck is D minus W? W is an adjacency matrix, right? So Wij, so W is an n by a matrix, n being the number of points. Each cell in the matrix Ij is the distance from vertex I to J, or the weighting in this case. Basically the edge weight, um, if it's connected, otherwise it's zero. So we just, basically, we're just putting the graph edges into an adjacency matrix. 
So we've now represented the whole graph in an adjacent solution. Everyone follow with that. Okay. Um, D is a diagonal matrix. So that means it only has entries on its, in its diagonal. It's also an n by n matrix, right? And each like I, I like D11, D22 is basically um, the sum of all the weights leading out from each vertex. So for vertex one, I will look at all the neighbors and all, like all the edges from vertex one to some other vertex, and I'll sum them and I'll put it in the diagonal. I'll put it in the diagonal matrix. So just the sum of edges. That makes sense. Okay, cool. So this is just a quick, quick example, right? If we have this graph over here, um, so these are five vertices, these are all my edge weights. I construct the adjacency matrix basically here um, with like the weights that they have. So you can see like if there's no edge, then it's a zero. Um, otherwise I put the edge weight there. Here that the diagonal matrix is just like, um, here each edge weight is like one. Um, so here's just like the degree of each vertex, like how many edges coming out of it. But if you had different weights, you just sum those weights and put it here. And then you subtract D minus A, right, to get the Laplacian. So all the diagonals will be positive, but then you're doing D minus A, D minus W, so that this, all these entries will be negative. And so you get this uh, Laplacian matrix. Does that make sense? Okay, step two. We have this Laplacian matrix, right? Step two, we're going to do SVD on it. So do you guys remember from the SVD lecture what that is? Right? These are basically, this is a diagonal matrix of your eigenvalues. Then you have your right eigenvectors and left eigenvectors. Right? Uh, so, interesting that thing to note is um, your eigenvalues actually represent how connected your graph is. So, what do I mean by this? If your graph, suppose your graph was two different subsets, right? One subset here, one subset here. And there were, there were no edges between them and you did the SVD on it, you would find that the two smallest eigenvalues were zero. Why? Because there's no connectivity between these two parts. If I had k different subsets, k different connected components that weren't connected to each other, then the k smallest eigenvalues would be zero. So the eigenvalues measure the connectivity of the graph, which is like so cool. Like, How do like doing SVD lead to this result, right? So we have this. Um, so remember our original goal, right? Finding the min cup. Um, so now we can use this intuition using the eigenvalues, right? The eigenvalue, like the smallest eigenvalue will tell us like where we can split our graph because our graph is least connected at that point. Does that make sense? So we want to focus on the smallest non-zero eigenvalue. And we want to use that eigenvalue and that eigenvector to split our graph. Does that make sense? Just the intuition. Yeah, question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, basically, if we have like two different subsets in our graph, that means like these are eigenvalues, right? They're ordered by how big they are. So the two smallest ones will be zero. Um, the reason for that is the eigenvalues kind of measure the connectivity of our graph. So if we have two subsets, then the two smallest will be zero. If we have like k subsets, the k smallest will be zero because there are no connections from the from each subset to like k other ones. Does that kind of make sense? So there's, I don't know like the formal mathematical like proof for that. Um, that's just like an intu intuitive answer. So basically, if we want to find the best way to split our graph, right? I mean, we can choose an eigenvalue that where it's zero, but the graph is already split there, right? So we want to choose the smallest non-zero eigenvalue and split it there. Yeah, um, and so if you have a fully connected graph, this means basically you pick the second smallest eigenvalue. Why? Because it, in a fully connected, like in a graph that's connected, you have one connected component. That means your smallest eigenvalue will be zero. So you choose the second smallest one. So this is a decomposition, right? These are your eigenvalues, these are your eigenvectors. So what we do is we choose the second eigenvector because it corresponds to the second eigenvalue, the second smallest eigenvalue, right? And the second smallest eigenvalue um, is the one that we want to look at because this one will be zero. So now we have this second smallest eigenvalue. Remember, this is like a D by N matrix or something like that. 
or n by d matrix, right? So each each column here um, is in is n dimensional. That means we have one entry for each uh, vertex. That means we can literally take this eigenvector and map it to the um, to our nodes. So essentially, what we're doing is we're looking at the second eigenvector, and then for element i in the eigenvector, we're assigning that element to node i. This seems arbitrary right now, but it'll make sense later, right? Um, yeah, we assign it to element i, um, and then and then we can do some splitting based on that. But like, first let's get some intuition. Why is this even reasonable, right? For example, take a look at this graph here, right? We can clearly see that there are like two clusters. Okay, so let's plot the entries of the second second eigenvector. Here, x2 is the second eigenvector, right? And then this is like the index of the eigenvector. So we see here that all the values are pretty close here, and then there's like a big jump, and then all these values there. And like, what do these indices correspond to? All these vertices. And then what do these indices correspond to? All those vertices. This is really cool, right? Like. The second eigenvector kind of represents the connectivity of this graph. So if we like find this splitting point, we can essentially say like, all right, all, all below this value, if your eigen if your eigen value if your eigenvector index value is less than this threshold, we're gonna say one cluster. Otherwise, you need the other cluster. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So like even cooler, right? We have like four connected components, or like one connected component, but four different like clusters that you can kind of see here, right? But this is like a harder graph, right? right? Like it's not immediately apparent. Well, look at the third eigenvector. Remember, the first eigenvector is gonna be zero. The third eigenvector, look at this. We see this four distinct groupings of the values corresponding to the four clusters. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so this is our algorithm, right? We're gonna find v2, our second eigenvector, and we're gonna split the vertices vertices into two sets, right? We're gonna we're gonna assign a node i equal to the first subset or first set if the eigen the v2 i like that dot index is greater than some threshold, right? Otherwise, we're going to assign it to S2. This is basically splitting on that threshold that I talked about earlier. Um, so common values for epsilon, you can say 0. You can say the median of your eigenvector. Um, both of them work. Oh, yeah, question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here? No, these are like the indices corresponding to the um, graph. Um, yeah, 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 that's a good point. Um, so this is like, okay, so I skipped a little bit ahead, but basically, like, um, the more clusters you have, the more eigenvectors you need to look at. Um, so if you saw, if you looked at just the second eigenvector, then you would get a split of two. And then if you look at the third eigenvector, now you get a split of two again. So, yeah, you're right. This doesn't really cor correspond to four. But if you use both of them together, then you get four. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I'll touch upon this again like later on. Any other questions? Okay. So right. Okay, this is good, right? But yeah, again, like you pointed out, like this means that at like for this like using this V two, right? We can only split our group into two subsets because we only have one threshold, right? Like it doesn't make sense to use like multiple thresholds. So like, what do we do in this case? If we want, we, our, our original goal is to get k clusters. We wanted k, we only have two. So we can like use this method recursively, right? We have two, and we use the same thing on these two connected components and do it recursively and recursively until we get k. Or there's an alternate strategy. So the alternate strategy, again, what we were alluding to, Instead of looking at the smallest eigenvector, look at the C smallest eigenvectors. So look at like a grouping of them, like five maybe, or six, not just one. Right? Obviously, like don't look at the smallest one because that'll be 
I'll be zero, but right? Okay. Now this means that each data point is represented in C dimensions. Does that make sense? Because before each data point, we just assign it to one value in the eigenvector. Here, we're assigning it to C values from C eigenvectors. Does that make sense? So each data point that now has a C dimensional representation. So this is essentially doing PCA. Does that, does that make sense? How this is like related to PCA? Some form of dimensionality reduction. And then we can just do k-means in this new space. So if we wanted k clusters, we find the Laplacian, we do SVD, we look at the c smallest eigenvectors, transform it to that space, and then do k-means to find the k clusters. Did that blow your mind? Yeah, I don't know how it works either. OK. Um, so you might think of like, okay, this is like so weird, like how could this possibly work? This is just like a random sequence of steps. Um, but it works like amazing, like amazing, amazing. So here's some graphs, right? So um, if anyone's heard of the NIPS, it's like a conference, right? So anyway, here we've like written out the NIPS 2001 with some data points, and we make eight clusters, right? So look at that, like, it finds these like relationships, these, like the zeros, ones, the n nips, like isn't that crazy? Like, you might think like clustering would find like these two data points to be together, but like this will look at the, the connectivity structure of your data. Um, here it'll find like a circle within a circle, you know. Here we have like a bunch of squiggly, squiggly lines. Like, look how close this one is getting to like this cluster, and it still it still got it correctly. And then up here, like this one is like really sparsely like populated, you know, like it's a really sparse ring around these two center clusters. But it's, instead of just calling it, you know, just like randomly picking these three, just it found this like really fine line, which is amazing. Pretty cool. So yeah, like this method is like one of the best methods for clustering. Why? Because constructing the graph in the Laplacian doesn't does not take that much like effort. There's not that much work. Um, doing PCA is not that much work. And then k-means at the end is not that much work, right? And you get pretty cool results. Um, it is like pretty sensitive to the hyperparameters. So for example, the hyperparameters are like how you construct your graph. So which edges to connect? Uh, how do you use the, di like what distance metric do you use? Um, stuff like that. But you still get really good results. Any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just like empirically what works the best for your data. I don't know of any like mathematical reason. It's just like use cross validation to figure out how it's good. Yep. Yeah. So um, all of these methods assume you feed in k, which is the number of clusters. Um, but you yourself don't necessarily need to know how many clusters there are. What you can do is split your data to training and test. And then it's not really training. I mean, you don't have labels on them. But you can just see like what's the error right, in your clusters for one versus the other. Um, and you just use cross-validation to pick the best k. So but that's something you do on your own. You use cross-validation to find the best k. But the algorithm like knows k from its beginning. So you have to give, give it k. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. I uh, think that's it. Yeah, any, any more questions? Anything? Yep. So, why does setting the eigenvectors of the Laplacian carry in terms of splitting up the data into parts? Uh, I honestly could not give you like a mathematical explanation for that. It just works? It just works. Okay. It's empirically found to work. And there are a bunch of papers on that, so like the mathematical rigor is there. So, if you're interested, I would like, suggest you go look at that. It would be pretty good. Um, I tried looking into it. Um, yeah, like, I couldn't, like, muster enough, like, reasoning to be able to present it here. I just felt like you, I should present it because it's really cool. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, that's it. Thanks for coming. Oh, and if you want to take a look at our unsupervised learning comic, feel free.
Yeah. And yeah, remember project three is due like today or tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Homework 3. Homework 3. Not project. Project 3 is due after Thanksgiving, so don't worry. Homework 3. Homework 3. <laughs> yeah. Would it be possible for you to take a look at something on homework 3? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I'm just like, I've been stuck on this error, uh, which is like, we can get an option here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, he's having the 5,000 ones. Oh, Okay. Oh, He's the guy with the black box. the Hey, what's up, Neil? How you doing? Good. 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 Give me a second. Uh, <laughs> I am having yeah? this like this air. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, oh um, um, they said you need a solution. Yeah. 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 I think I have a solution. I'm just gonna head up. Yeah. Hey, there, like there is no class next to you. Dude, this okay, room. Um, there's actually a midterm in this room. There's a midterm here every freaking week. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's a midterm here? Yeah, there's a midterm here. Yeah, uh, let me just stop this. Let's take this outside to that side. Okay. okay. Um, I think I, have a, I might have a solution here. Problem. Do um, look at you. You did like.